This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. A little while ago, I did a series of talks on the prophetic gift in the Old Testament and the New Testament and some practical concerns about how that gift is expressed in the church today. If you haven't listened to those, I encourage you to go hunt them down and take a listen. That'll help you get a good idea of my understanding of the scriptures related to the prophetic gift as well as the spiritual gifts more generally. Today, I feel like I should do once again what I've done a few times before, which is to pray and see if the Lord has anything specific for us, not just for you, it's also for me. I want to give the Lord the opportunity, make space for him to speak something to us right now, and it's one expression of that prophetic gift. Well, right now I won't cover the same ground that I've covered recently. However, I will mention something that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when Paul is giving instructions to the local congregation there about how this prophetic gift is to be exercised. He says, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And I present this to you as well. I really have no idea what I'm about to say. I just want to listen and see if the Lord has something for us. But when I present it to you, I present it humbly with the hopes that it'll encourage you or comfort you, strengthen you, build you up. And I encourage you to weigh carefully what I'm about to say. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you live by the Spirit and have the indwelling Spirit, then you have the right and the responsibility to discern spiritually the truth or the application of what I'm about to say. And I don't claim to be perfect. I may be wrong about some things. So together, let's discern what the Lord is saying. We are a kingdom of priests. We no longer have a priestly class that stands between us and God. Each of us can boldly come before his throne. Each of us is given the Spirit. So let's make every effort to live by the Spirit. And wherever you are right now when you're listening, I encourage you just to quieten your spirit before the Lord and ask him to speak to you, just as I'm doing right now as well. And we trust that he is able to speak. And another thing that I've mentioned in the past, in this recording, if I edit it the way I have in the past, you'll hear gaps between the things that I share. Uh, I take a lot more time than you'll hear, but I remove much of that time so that it's not so boring for you just to hear nothing. So I'll leave, uh, I don't know, a few seconds or so between these different thoughts that I have, things that I feel like God is saying. But it takes a bit longer than that, usually. And it's part of the way things are done when editing audio. I try to remove any elements that will distract you from the message. So what you're hearing is a cleaned up version of what's actually happening as I record. But the primary reason is I don't want anything that I say or do to distract you. So I get rid of a bunch of ums and ahs, and sometimes I'll start sentences over again, just so that it all flows nicely and is clear. So with that, I'm just going to pray and see if the Lord brings anything to mind, a scripture or an image, and I hope that it'll be an encouragement to you. So Lord, what do you have for us? Do you have anything for us? Okay, so this is an interesting picture that I have. And as I describe the image that I'm seeing, I think there'll be more revelation about the application of it. And again, I submit this to you. Please weigh it carefully if it applies to you. I see a, it's a picture or, yes, I see a person falling in darkness, falling backwards. They're falling, almost like falling down a shaft or in a dark area and falling with their back leading as they fall so that they're, this person is falling and trying to reach and grab something that's above to hold on to keep from falling. So there's a sense of 
of out being out of control, a sense of falling away from where you were, even a sense of falling away from the light into darkness, kind of just falling and trying to grab after a rope or something to hang on to, reaching up but falling away. And uh, you can't see what's behind you because your back is down and you're falling backwards down into this darkness and you're reaching and grabbing to hold on to something to keep you from falling deeper, but there's nothing to hold on to. You're completely in the air falling. And my sense is, well, you know, you're afraid of what's going to happen as you fall, that you're going to hit hard or disappear down into this darkness. But what I feel like the Spirit is saying is don't be afraid. You are falling away from things that you've known and you're falling away from things that were familiar to you and you're falling into a dark, unknown future, I guess is one way to think about it. And it seems to be all negative, that you're falling away and you've got nothing to hold on to and at some point you're going to hit and be hurt. And yet I feel like the Spirit is saying, don't be afraid of that you're not actually going to hit hard and you're actually falling into his hands. The hands of God are down below and they're there to catch you and soften the landing and you're going to land in his hands. And in a sense, you're going to land in his will. Even though you are out of control and it may feel like depression, perhaps, a darkness that's clouding around you, and yeah, you're, you're moving away from the things that you've known and the things that you've understood. And you feel like you're losing something, but you're actually falling into the will of God. And he's allowing this to happen. Let's see if there's any other message that might come with that image. If you think that this applies to you, and you have a sense of spiritually or maybe emotionally falling away from the light and trying to hold on to something that would keep you from falling, but you're just out of control. The primary word to you is fear not. Don't be afraid. Stop expending all this energy trying to save yourself because it's actually not going to help you. You will not be able to save yourself in this situation. There is nothing for you to hold on to. You're out in space, away from everything that is solid or stable or stationary, and you're falling into the hands of God. You are falling. Amen. He's going to catch you. He says, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Relax. (laughs) I guess in one sense, enjoy the ride. When we fall, we're weightless, in a sense. Time and space and speed all sort of fade away as we're falling. Just trust. Trust that as you fall and you don't see where you're going and you don't see what's below you, you don't see the end of this process. The end of the process is that you will be gently cradled in the hands of God. Trust him. Put your trust in him. Stop striving. And it makes sense that the scripture would come to mind. Jesus said, if anyone tries to save his life, he'll lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. So don't try to save your life. It's not going to work. Let go of your life and trust him to be that comforter and the one who catches you and holds you in his hands. Amen. Okay. Let's see if the Lord has anything else for us today. Okay, the scripture comes to mind from Galatians chapter 6. The words that came to my mind were, let us not become weary in doing good. And I want to go back a little bit. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 7. And I'll read this and maybe talk about it a little bit. But I believe this scripture is for someone who's listening right now. And as I talk, I encourage you, pray now and ask, Lord, is this for me? And it may not be for you. It might be for somebody that you know. 
So it's good to listen to what the Lord is saying, even if it's not for us specifically. <laughs> that reminds me, I remember a Bible teacher saying that a lot of people read the Bible like they read their high school yearbook. And for those people outside of the United States may not know about this, in high school in the United States, very often, every year, there's a book that's printed and it has pictures of all the students and pictures of all the classes and special events, sporting teams, and and just various pictures of life at the school. And when you get the yearbook, it's called a yearbook at the end of the year, very often the first thing I did, and a lot of people do, is to flip through that yearbook and find pictures of myself. That's what I would do. Try to find me in that book. But there's so much more information in the book than just me. And we need to be careful not to read the Bible that way, to look in the Bible and try to find ourselves. We need to look in the Bible and find God and his story. And now as I share the scripture, if it's not for you, it may be for somebody that you know. And of course, it's always good to be reminded of the truths that God gives us. Galatians 6, starting in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially those who belong to the family of believers. Amen. Well, I'll just look at this for a second, see if God brings anything out for us to contemplate. The first thing that really stands out to me is this message of reaping and sowing. Uh, matter of fact, in a future talk, I may come to this theme, uh, what are the things that we sow and what are the things that we reap? Well, the first thing here that Paul says is God cannot be mocked. We cannot think that God is foolish, that we can mock him by acting in an ungodly way and not reaping what we've sown. God is unchanging and he sees all. Paul here says, people reap what they sow. Boy, isn't that true? How many of us know from our own experience that we act in a certain way and then consequences follow, naturally follow, and there's no stopping those consequences? A man reaps what he sows. That's true. And if we sow to please ourselves, our sinful nature, well, the seeds are pleasure within the sinful nature. But what do those seeds bring? What is the fruit of those seeds and its destruction? The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit will reap eternal life. Amen. All through life, we have times of sowing and reaping. We have different seasons, of course, but I also think that we're constantly sowing and we're constantly reaping. If right now you're reaping some destruction from your previous activities where you were pleasing your sinful nature, well, now's the time to start sowing for the Spirit and trusting God that there is a harvest ahead that's good. And this is why Paul says, don't become weary in doing good, because when the time comes, when harvest time comes, we're going to have a good harvest if we don't give up. And therefore, you and me, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who belong to the family of believers. Okay, so I'm praying about what a specific application might be for someone who is listening. I think there may be people listening who are in circumstances within a local congregation where there's stress and there's enmity or miscommunication or perhaps some distrust from one party to another within the church. And the Lord is telling you, do good to those people. Go ahead and sow in the Spirit. Make every effort to keep spiritual unity with other people in your fellowship. Don't grow weary in doing good, regardless of what the other party is doing. Don't give up 
doing the right thing, living by the Spirit, considering the best of these other people, keeping no record of wrongs, loving them with an agape love, which means try to find a need that they have and then take action to meet that need. Because when you do that, you are sowing to the Spirit and you are going to reap life. So do good. Don't grow weary in doing good. And of course, the image here is a farmer who is sowing seeds. And if the farmer gets through half the field and gets tired and gives up, well, you're not going to get a full harvest just because you got tired. You got to press through with that process of sowing and you've got to finish that job. So I encourage you, don't grow weary. It certainly is tiring. We all know that relationships are tiring sometimes. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in this world who have been wearied by trying to work things out with me as well. So let's consider the best of our brothers and sisters. And whenever you have an opportunity, do good to the people that belong to the family of believers. Another thing comes to mind just as I said that sentence, and you'll hear it at the end of every one of these talks when my daughter quotes Jesus. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And I think his encouragement to you is whenever you have an opportunity, do good to people in your church, and you're going to be really, really blessed if you'll do that. So I encourage you, do it. Do good. Don't grow weary in doing good. Press on and persevere in doing good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Amen. Okay, Lord, what else do you have for us today? All right, well, pretty quickly after I finish saying what I just said, a verse from earlier in Galatians came to mind from the beginning of chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So this is a word for all of us. Jesus came to set people free. In the book of Hebrews, it says that he came to set us free from that fear of death, people who had been held in bondage to the fear of death. He's come to set us free. So stand firm and don't go back to the old things that held you in bondage. Jesus did come to give us freedom, freedom to love him, freedom to be obedient to him, freedom to walk with him. And the old ways of thinking and the world's ways of thinking, those are all bondages. They really bind us and limit us. And the Lord came to set us free so we can really be who he has created us to be, which is people who are in fellowship with him and receive life from him and have joy and peace in the Spirit. A little bit later there, just after this, a few verses down, Paul says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We're not given freedom so that we can gratify ourselves. We are given freedom so that we can love, truly love, selflessly, that we can live by faith. What Paul is saying here is the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We balance that against what religious people would say is what really matters is our good deeds and doing religious activities that will somehow make us better so that we can be approved by God. But what really matters, the thing that counts, is living by faith. That's what God values, that our faith is credited to us as righteousness and that faith is expressed in a loving way, that our faith finds its expression through service to others, considering their needs above our own. And our faith is expressed by obedience to Christ because we consider his will above our own will. Now, let me just say those two things again. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. A little further, you, my brothers, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. This is what the Lord is saying to us. 
we were called to be free, and we should not go back to the old things that bound us and tied us down, this yoke of slavery. What he wants us doing is living by faith and loving others, serving others, not gratifying ourselves. Amen. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. There's a good word. Since we live by the Spirit, since we have our life by the Spirit, we need to walk with the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. The life of a believer is not one of sitting in a classroom and hearing lessons. The life of a believer is walking with the Lord and learning as we go through life. It's a path. It's a way. It's a road of living by faith. We're not static and sitting in one place. We walk with the Lord, and we need to keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. God, what else do you have for us today? Okay, Proverbs 14, verse 12 comes to mind. And I may have mentioned this previously, but it's been a while, so it's okay if I'm repeating myself. Now that I look at it, it's also on the theme of a path. I just said that the Lord is calling us to walk in step with the Spirit. And here is Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Boy, there's a caution for us. That is a real caution. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. I was talking yesterday with somebody and mentioned hedonism, and he asked what exactly is hedonism. And it's that philosophy that says the pursuit of pleasure is the only good. And there are a lot of people that think that is the right path. That seems right to them. On this earth, the most important thing is for us to avoid pain and pursue pleasure. But that ends in death. We just read that anyone who sows for their sinful nature, for the pleasure of their flesh, they're going to reap destruction. A lot of people think that's the right way. In Western culture, much of the pressure of the culture is towards self-gratification, self-enjoyment self-love. And because people grow up surrounded by that kind of thinking, they think that is the right way. It seems right because that message is constantly being reinforced by the world. It seems right, but it leads to death. It leads to a separation from the source of life, God our Creator. It seems right, but it's not right. So I think this is a caution for some who are listening. I'm certainly taking it to heart right now. This message that we may think we're on the right path because it seems like that's the right path, but we have to be very careful to live by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit and not let the world's philosophies, the world's ways of thinking bind us and tie us down and keep us from living fruitful, Spirit-filled, eternally valuable lives. Somebody listening today is involved in something like this. You're on a way that seems right to you. People around you may be reinforcing this. Your own family may be saying, yes, this is the right thing. But in your spirit, you know that it's not the right thing. You know that God doesn't want you on this pathway. You know that the Lord is not pleased with the decisions you're making. So this is a caution to you. If what I'm saying is touching your heart, I give you a very strong caution in the Spirit. You need to get off that path. You need to change your thinking about that. You need to live by the Spirit. God is calling you to live by the Spirit because the path that you're on is leading to death. The very thing that you hope for, which is a fulfilled and happy life, is not on this path, though people around you may be saying that that is the goal of where you're going, that's where you're headed, but actually you're sowing seed that is going to end up in destruction. 
There is a way that seems right to you, but in the end it leads to death. I encourage you, if this is bringing conviction to your heart, I think you need to stop and take whatever time is necessary to listen to what the Lord is saying and then be obedient, even if it means offending family members who thought that you were in agreement with them. Amen. I think this may be a prophetic word for somebody. You're in a situation where some of your family is encouraging you to take a step and the people that are in authority over you, family members, people that you love and have trusted, they're encouraging you to do something that you know in your spirit is just not of the Lord. I don't know what that is. I don't know the circumstances at all, but the Lord does. And I think he's giving you a word right now to wait and stop what you're doing. A moment of reassessing, stepping away from things. If you need to take two or three days to get away, do it. Yeah, amen. Two or three days is what you need. I do believe this is a word for somebody who's listening. Don't let your family pressure you into making a decision or choosing a pathway that is not within the will of God. And the Lord is saying, stop that process and take two or three days to shake that off and pray for wisdom. Ask him to show you the good way. He will. He loves you enough to prompt me right now to say this because he wants you to hear it. Amen. So, again, I want to say that of the people listening to this, this may only apply to one. It may not apply to anybody, but I feel a pretty firm conviction in my spirit that there is somebody who's listening right now that this message is for. So please carefully weigh what I'm saying because it's really serious. The Lord comes to seek and to save the lost. He does not come to condemn. He comes to save. And he is not condemning you. He is speaking clearly so that you can be saved from some really big hurt that's going to come later at harvest time if you don't stop sowing what you're sowing right now and keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. Keep in step with the Spirit. Well, let's see if the Lord has anything else. Amen. Okay, this is a little bit of an odd image, <laughs> and I'm going to talk it out. Uh, and as I talk, hopefully there'll be some clarity to it. It's interesting. It's another image of falling, but it's in a very different manner. I see a picture of a person falling off a waterfall, but it's a brightly lit waterfall, really beautiful. The water coming off the waterfall is almost like diamonds glittering as they fall. And the river is swiftly flowing, and the sun is out. It's a beautiful day. And there's a person coming over the waterfall. What I'm seeing it is I'm sort of halfway down this really tall waterfall, and I see a person come off the waterfall from the river above. But rather than falling down, how can I say this? The person who comes off the waterfall continues on a path as if the river continued on the path that it was on without the waterfall. <laughs> so it's sort of floating through the air and continuing on downstream, but the water drops off from beneath you, but, but you continue on downstream. <laughs> uh, it's not flying. It's as if you're still floating in that river, moving pretty quickly in the river, but the water has fallen away, and you're continuing on down. So you're not falling, as one might expect, and going to land hard or drown or anything. You just continue on your way, but miraculously. Amen. That may be the key word. So my sense with this picture is that you've been floating in a river, a beautiful river. It's been lovely. It's a beautiful day. The water has been moving swiftly, but it's not scary. And then you come to a waterfall, which seems to be the end of this process that you've been in. And I wonder if this applies to somebody who's changing jobs. That comes to mind. Maybe even you've been fired. That the circumstance that you've been in has been pleasant and moving quickly, and you've been very confident in it. And then suddenly it just disappears. It's like it's gone. Like this waterfall, just the river drops off out from underneath you. 
may have something to do with a job or a transition in your professional life. That's what I'm feeling, that you would expect to fall <laughs> because the water has fallen away from you, but you don't fall. You're actually going to continue along that path, but in a miraculous way. So I think that may be what this image is communicating. You're moving through life. You've been in a particular circumstance in life, and I think it may be related to your profession or a particular job. And now that circumstance is falling away, and you think that you're going to fall too, but you don't. You're going to move forward miraculously. And my sense is the person who is doing this is actually very happy and exhilarated with the realization that, oh, I'm not falling down into the depths of the gorge. I'm continuing on my way, but now I'm up in the air flying, sort of, <laughs> that it's exhilarating and it's fun and it's... uh. It's going to be something completely new and unexpected for you and really miraculous. Amen. So if this is speaking to you, I'm saying don't don't worry about things. As a matter of fact, the opposite. God's going to move you into something new and of him that clearly is not of you. And it's going to be exhilarating. You're going to find energy and you're going to enjoy it. You know, it comes to mind when Peter tries to walk on the water. He's watching Jesus and he gets out and he he walks miraculously, but then when he looks at his circumstances, he begins to sink. And I think this may be a word for you as well. Don't worry about where that waterfall went or where your old job was. Don't even worry about that. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Live in this fun, exhilarating, miraculous thing that's happening. Yeah, I think God is going to bring something to you that you would never have imagined just as a person floating down a river comes to a waterfall, they would imagine that they're going to fall with the water. But in this image, the person doesn't. So what's coming is really unimaginable for you. So be willing to walk in that. And don't be like Peter. Try hard not to be like Peter. Try not to look at your circumstances, but enjoy the life that God is giving you, this new thing that's coming. Amen. Again, I want to say that it's exhilarating for you. It's really going to be fun, but it's going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced or even imagined could happen to you. Yeah, so be willing to go on that ride with the Lord into the things that are of the Spirit, miraculous, surprising. And I can say, honestly, as your brother in the Lord, from experience, those times are a lot of fun. They can be pretty turbulent and confusing, but boy, the fruit is good and the lessons learned are excellent. And it's a taste of what it is to be shed of all the stuff here on earth. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, that image is a person that's being shed of the law of gravity. <laughs> that you just aren't bound anymore by those rules of the world. Amen. Let's see if there's anything else here. Okay. Amen. Psalm 37 comes to mind. Actually, verse 7 is what came to my mind immediately. But I think I want to read most or all of Psalm 37 here for you. Certainly the first part. And I believe this is a message for all who are listening right now. Yeah, amen. That's a bold statement. But I believe this is a message for you. Wherever you are, uh, whatever day it is, you may be listening to this a few years from when I record it. Psalm 37 is what the Lord wants people to hear right now. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger, turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. 
for evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Amen. I'll stop there, but I encourage you to read all of Psalm 37. It's excellent. And a few things I just want to underscore here. There is this theme of not fretting, not being anxious when we see people around us succeed in their evil ways. Don't worry about that because that is temporary. That is not eternal. We need to put our trust in the Lord and we need to continue doing good. Amen. There's that theme. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. And we've heard that quite a bit today. Don't grow weary in doing good. So what are the imperatives here? Trust in the Lord, dwell in the land, do good, enjoy safe pasture, delight yourself in the Lord. Amen. Second half of verse 4 is something that I've thought about quite a bit. He will give you the desires of your heart. I used to think that that meant that I had a desire in my heart and God would fulfill that desire. But now I understand it to mean that he actually puts those desires in my heart. He actually gives me desires in my heart. Before I moved to Russia, I had absolutely no idea that I had a desire to live in Russia. (laughs) And he gave me that desire and then fulfilled it. Okay, more commandments here for you. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently. Do not fret. Refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Those are the things we need to be doing, not worrying about what other people are doing or what they seem to be succeeding in. We need to trust the Lord, rest in him, delight ourselves in him, commit our ways to him. Amen. We need to be still before him and wait patiently for him. So I think I'll close with this because this is the verse that came to mind as I was praying just now. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Amen. That's the word for us today, to be still before him and to be patient as we wait for him. So my friends, I pray that you will learn more and more what it means to be still before the Lord and to wait with patience for him. Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't be anxious. Commit your way to him and trust in him. And he's going to do something. He is going to make your righteousness shine like the dawn. Amen. There's a harvest of righteousness and peace for his people who have waited patiently for him and borne up through difficult circumstances. Well, my friends, until next time, I pray that the Lord will continue to lead you in his ways and teach you his word. I pray that he'll give you the grace to be still before him and to wait patiently for him. His ways are always good and they always lead to peace for the soul. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.